This is an indoor air quality monitor. It displays carbon dioxide concentration in parts per million, provides a level indicator, and wirelessly connects to an app where you can see how these measurements change over time. It's also a great example of an embedded system. If we look inside this device, we'll find a microcontroller that periodically reads from a sensor, writes to an e-ink display, and manages a Bluetooth low energy interface. I've been looking for one last embedded Rust project to tackle with a micro bit before moving on to other hardware, and I think building something like this might be a good send off. The micro bit's already got a built-in display, its expansion connector should make it really easy to connect to CO2 sensor, and it's even got the right antenna and transceiver to enable Bluetooth connectivity. So, starting today, we're embarking on a three video voyage to build a less polished, but more rusty, air quality monitor. Our goal today is to find a CO2 sensor and any other parts we need to get it connected to the micro bit, and then figure out how to start collecting some measurements using Rust. For this kind of project, my first stop is usually Adafruit or SparkFun, because they'll often take the part you're looking for and mount it to a nice breakout board that makes it really easy to connect to. We've got a few different options here for a CO2 sensor. Let's check out the SCD40. Okay, it looks like it uses I2C to communicate and has power, ground, clock, and data lines running out to plated through holes or a quick connector. This sensor is actually measuring CO2 instead of approximating it from something else, so it should be pretty accurate. And measurement range is 400 to 2000 ppm. There's also a more expensive version that goes up to 5000 ppm. My goal with the project is just to provide some feedback so that levels don't get too high. The RNET's unhealthy threshold is 1400, so 2000 is good for an upper limit. The sensor should be fine. Next, we need to figure out how to get it connected to the micro bit. The SCD40 needs 3.3 volts ground and the I2C clock and data lines, and all of these are present on the micro bit's expansion connector. The cheapest plug and play solution is probably this breakout board from SparkFun which has the same quick connector that's used by our sensor. But with everything connected, it is a bit awkward if you want the micro bit to sit upright on your desk. This is why I went with the Bitmaker Lite from Seed Studios. It uses a larger Grove connector for I2C that requires an adapter cable, but it also has a micro USB port and 3.3 volt regulator that can power both boards. Annoyingly, these have recently been discontinued but the larger Bitmaker V2 is still available, at least for now. All right, we've found our parts. Now we've got to figure out how to communicate with that sensor. The SCD40 uses I squared C or I2C to communicate with our microcontroller. In this chapter, we're gonna go over how it works. I2C is a two wire interface, but unlike a serial port where each device has its own line to send data, I2C uses one line as a shared data bus and the other as a clock. This means that each party needs to wait for its turn to speak on the wire, but it also means that it's possible to connect a lot more than two devices. And I2C was designed for this purpose, to act as a local bus on your board, allowing a processor to communicate with a number of other integrated circuits using just two wires. I2C stands for Inter-Integrated Circuit, and yeah, that's what it's doing. For a system like this to work, there's a bit more involved than just specifying baud rate and framing information. I2C specifies an entire protocol that covers everything from managing access to the bus, to how to exchange data, ranges of allowed clock rates for different modes of operation, and a whole lot more. The official spec from NXP is around 60 pages, and if you've got the time, it's worth a read. But for the TLDR, let's just hit on some of the essentials. There are two roles for devices on the I2C bus. The controller, which is responsible for initiating communication, and the targets that respond to the controller's requests. There's often only one controller on the bus and one or more targets that are identified by a unique seven or 10 bit address. And while both parties will take turns transmitting on the data line, only the controller will toggle the clock line high and low, dictating the timing of each transfer. 
In some documentation, you'll find the terms master and slave used for these roles, but I'm mostly going to be sticking with the modern nomenclature from NXP. To see how these parties communicate and make all this a bit more real, let's go over some actual I2C exchanges captured by a logic analyzer. From an idle bus, the controller begins by pulling the data line low, which is known as the start condition. Then, it will send out the 7-bit address for the target it's interested in, while toggling the clock line high and low, and conclude the first byte with a 1-bit indicator to identify the direction of any data that will follow. Each byte that goes out on the data line must be acknowledged by the receiving party, which happens in a 1-bit slot at the end of the byte. An active or low state here is a positive ACK, and passive or high is interpreted as a NACK, effectively ending that interaction. If the controller is sending data to the target, the direction bit will be cleared and those bytes are transmitted next. The transaction ends with a stop condition to release the bus back to idle, or a repeated start to begin the next operation. If the controller needs to read data from the target, then the process repeats starting with the address, but this time the direction bit is set, prompting the target to send the requested data. And after receiving the last byte, it concludes again with the controller issuing a stop or repeated start condition. So basically, data can only go in one direction for a given operation, and the controller initiates all data transfers. Personally, I think the read and write terminology used for the direction bit can be a little confusing because to actually read from a target, you need two operations, a write for the controller to identify what it wants, and then a read to allow the target to actually send that data. Okay, at this point, we know more than enough about I2C to make sense of what we'll read in our sensor's data sheet or in Rust documentation. Speaking of which, So where does I2C fit into embedded Rust? Well, you'll typically be working with a hardware abstraction layer crate for your microcontroller that has a type to manage each of its peripherals, including I2C. Then in another crate, you'll have the driver for your target device that takes ownership of that I2C peripheral to perform write and read operations. The glue that holds this system together is the I2C trait, defined in the embedded HAL crates. This will be implemented by your microcontroller's HAL for its I2C peripheral type. And an instance of that type will be passed to your driver during construction, taking it as a generic argument bound by the I2C trait. This interface serves as the foundation for an ecosystem of platform agnostic drivers, allowing any I2C device driver crate to work with any HAL crate. If we take a look at the I2C trait, we'll find one required method, transaction that takes a set of data transfer operations that are performed between start and stop conditions. This returns a result that has an associated error type, which is defined by a super trait. This is used to effectively bring your HAL's I2C error enum into the trait, and implementing error for that enum provides a mapping between the HAL-specific error variants and the more general kinds that might be encountered during I2C operations. As usual, today's project is up on the Rusty Bits GitHub account with the code for the end of each episode in its respective directory, or you can load up start to follow along with me. We're going to need to run a few tasks concurrently, so we're starting with an async thread mode executor from Embassy, and we're also using Embassy time for timekeeping. I'm going to add Embassy NRF as our HAL for the microbits NRF52833 plus deformat and features supporting Embassy time. Okay, let's start by getting a handle to the peripherals from the HAL using the default configuration. And look in here for an I2C peripheral instance, which we don't find because Nordic uses the TWI or two wire interface nomenclature instead. This is a pretty common way for manufacturers to refer to their I2C compatible peripherals. The SPI term hanging off the end here just indicates that the same underlying hardware is used for the SPI peripheral as well. So let's create an I2C controller or master from one of the TWI SPI peripheral instances. 
then we'll need to bind the twist by zero interrupt to the HAL's async friendly handler function. This will ensure that our executor will wake up our task when I2C events happen. Next, we need to know which pins to use for data and clock lines. So it's time to check the microbit schematic. And if we go backwards from the expansion port, we find they go to port one, pin zero, and port zero, pin 26. So let's get those in next. And we'll just go with the default configuration for now. If we take a quick peek into this HAL, we can verify that it does actually implement the I2C trait for the async embedded HAL, and also the error type super trait, making the HAL's error enum an associated type, which, in turn, implements the I2C error trait to provide a conversion to the more general kinds defined in the embedded HAL. Okay, we've got a HAL that implements the I2C trait. Now we need a driver for our sensor. My first instinct from years of building embedded projects in C is to crack open our sensor's data sheet and start writing a driver. But in Rust, it is better to check crates IO first and see if someone else has already walked this path. And yes, two candidates actually, both of which seem to be active. Let's check libscd first. All right, it supports the blocking and async embedded HALs. There's an example with Embassy showing how to use it. And it's got a table describing the various feature flags. We'd need SCD4X for our sensor, async to use their async API, and dformat for logging. So let's get that added. Okay, now we can create an instance of our sensor and pass in our I2C controller. It also wants a delay type, which we'll take from embassy time. And the remainder of our code to periodically read from the sensor and print out the measured value is gonna look a lot like their example. Okay, pretty much exactly like this example. Except we'll be using the async I2C trait instead of the blocking one. So we'll just add a weight in a few places convert the delay, and that should work, right? Probably, but I'd feel more comfortable checking with the data sheet, just in case there's anything else we should know. Aside from giving it a once over, which I recommend doing, there is one thing in particular that I'm looking for. Timing. With any device, there's always some minimum period you need to wait after it's reset before you can start communicating with it. In this case, 30 milliseconds. Now, we did give the driver's constructor a delay type that it can use, but this function is an async, and yeah, it's just getting stored away for later. So I'm gonna be conservative and assume that both the microcontroller and the sensor are coming out of reset, and just add that delay before we send the first command. Another timing consideration has to do with any delays we might need between commands. In I2C, the controller decides when the target gets to send data by toggling the clock line. And this can lead to some issues if the target's not actually ready. The data sheet here does a nice job of identifying how long you should wait before starting the next operation. And the driver code has got this covered for us. The example points out one other thing to be aware of, that there are two modes of operation, and in one of them, periodic measurement mode, you can only send a subset of the possible commands. When our microcontroller boots up, we have no idea which mode the sensor is in, so this example does the safe thing and tries to turn off periodic measurement mode before we ask for the serial number. The last thing I'll mention from the datasheet has to do with calibrating the sensor. There is an automatic calibration routine that runs during measurement mode, which assumes that it will be exposed to fresh air at least once per week after racking up four hours of use. So the initial measurements we see may be a bit off until this completes. All right, let's run this code and see if it works. 
Um, okay, that's not good. Failed to transmit on I2C. Oh, not again. I forgot these bitmaker boards have a power switch on the side. So, you know, make sure the LEDs are on. Let's try this again. Serial number. That's a good sign. And hey, look at that. CO2. Yeah, that's in the ballpark. Humidity and temperature. Both look pretty good, actually. Nice. Time for some closing thoughts and a little bit of housekeeping. To finish up, I want to point out one I2C thing I blew past earlier, and then do a little cleanup to leave our code in a better state for the next episode. Some of you may have noticed that we passed ownership of the I2C controller to the device, meaning that if we had other devices on this bus, we wouldn't be able to set up their drivers. In this case, we'd want to pull in the Embassy Embedded HAL, which makes sharing the bus easy. All we'd have to do is wrap our controller in a mutex, then generate an I2C device from that for each of the drivers. Okay, on to a little refactoring. Pretty soon we're gonna have a lot more log messages, so I'm gonna squeeze this one down to a single line. And I find the float values are kind of noisy. Integers here are fine. Next, I'm gonna create a new module for all of this sensor code. and we'll have this running in its own embassy task. Having a dedicated task or thread to manage communication with a connected device is always a good idea. This will also eventually provide an interface to serve up CO2 data to downstream consumers like the display and Bluetooth modules. We'll get this spawned in the main task. And that should do it. All right, we're off to a good start with this project. Next time, we're gonna cover how to display the CO2 concentration on the Microbits LED matrix. So thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you then.